Hello and welcome to the next episode of the Klingberg Wing Mark II Development. I'm Raul Klingberg, your host. Today we're going to talk about hinge lines, how control surfaces are hinged, and uh, some of the issues with how the hinges are designed and built. Okay, welcome back. So as you can see, we're enjoying another day of hot weather here in California. It seems like the heat just won't quit this year. So uh, I, I just wanted to be able to get you in close enough. I want you to be able to see me, my hands, and uh, the hinge line here and the gap that we're going to talk about. So we went out recently uh, to do uh, more ground testing of the wing. We made some changes. Uh, so we put the pilot further back. That would be me. Uh, and move the CG further back and a couple other minor things to uh, get closer to a flight configuration. And we needed to go and characterize how effective the flaps are and what the stall speed might be like and what controllability is like. Now, uh, if uh, you're one of my patrons, you know that we also went to New Jerusalem Airport and we tried a little bit of towing. Uh, we weren't too successful at the towing. Uh, I'll put up a picture here where we were setting up. Uh, it's a nice long runway, and we were able to tow into the wind. Uh, and actually, what I did learn is that uh, I felt that I had sufficient aileron control. Uh, whenever the wing would pick up a little bit, I could uh, uh, get it back down, and I could uh, use my nose wheel steering uh, to get back on track. Uh, so I felt pretty comfortable with that. Uh, but the nose wheel steering is uh, reverse of normal on that setup. And uh, when you have one wing up and you need to steer the other way, it's cross control. It's a little confusing. Uh, and eventually we ended up breaking uh, the nose gear uh, on that. So the next day we just decided to go to Marina Beach. Marina Beach is supposed to be blowing 15, but it actually went 12, 14. But that's close enough. Uh, stall speed, as we've come to learn, is about 18 miles an hour with the flaps deployed. Uh, so that means I'd be, you know, on a short little hop, I'd be flying about 20 miles an hour. And that's only five mile an hour ground speed, uh, five or six. And I'd have plenty of room to dump flaps or turn before I got to the ocean and avoid that darn lifeguard station that they put up. Oh, and by the way, if uh, you're with the California Park Service, I'd like to know why you put up a lifeguard station. You don't use it. <laughs> Actually, I just thought it was funny. It's a typical government thing. So they put up this lifeguard station. Nobody goes in it. It's in the way of everybody who wants to fly there. I think they don't want us to fly there anymore. Um, they sit in the truck at the, at the top of the hill, but nobody seems to go in the lifeguard station. But that's just a little aside. There you go. That's my rant. And let's get back to the aerodynamics. So we needed to repeat some of the ground handling that we had done previously in nice steady winds. Uh, so we got her up on the sawhorses and I could uh, fly it up off the sawhorses and literally fly it in place. Uh, shoulder harness on for doing the lift and, and fly it right in place. And we experienced some difficulties. Sometimes it went fine, sometimes not. Uh, sometimes I'd run out of control. I'd have that stick all the way forward or over in a corner and the wing was just not recovering. It's like, wow, uh, it seemed fine at New Jerusalem. Uh, the wing would go down a little bit, I'd pick it right up. Very effective controls. In fact, the first time that we went to Pacifica, uh, I had had uh, good control light, but good control all the way down to six miles an hour. Uh, very light breeze, good control. And here it is, it's blowing hard and I'm shoving the stick around and the wing's not responding. And that's a problem uh, because if you get into a condition in flight where a thermal kicks up your wing, you might need significant control throw uh, to recover. So uh, we had an issue and I'm going to uh, put up a video here. Uh, you're going to take a look for a moment and you will see that uh, when I go to um, uh, essentially down Elevon like this, in other words, when I want to put the nose back down, in other words, I'm flying the wing up off the sawhorses, and then, oh, I get close to stall, and I put the wing back down, and I put him down elevator like this. And if a wing picks up, well, I might have to put him even more down to, get, to correct that uh, roll that's getting induced. And you'll see what's happening. As soon as the elevon uh, passes, oh, much about 10 degrees, somewhere around in here, all the telltales turn and go straight out to the tip like this. They just turn 90 degrees, just like this and zoom all the flow on the elevon goes whoop, straight out the elevon 
And let me tell you, when the flow is going here, perfectly straight, all the way up to this point, turns 90 degrees and goes that way, wing doesn't fly so good. <laughs> the, the flow over the elevon is uh, detached, uh, or it's uh, run, it, what little flow you have is running out to the wing tip, which is typical of a, a swept, uh, tapered uh, wing uh, when it's stalled. So we knew that this, the elevon was getting stalled. But why? You know, it's, it's only about 10 or 15 degrees of deflection. Uh, so here, you take a look, and uh, I'll switch this over to that video. You take a quick look, and you'll see what happens. Okay, welcome back. So what you saw was... I lifted the nose up, the wing begins to stall, and I need to put the wing back down. So I, I put, put in some down elevon. And uh, I probably needed to put in a little bit more down elevon for some roll that was building up. And uh, this all stalls, flow runs out to the tip, and I have no control anymore. Uh, it's bad. <laughs> I, I can't get a wing back up. Uh, I cannot get the nose back down. Uh, in fact, it's kind of self-defeating. Uh, nose goes up, the wing is stalled, I need to put the wing down, so I put this down, and it's even worse. More of the wing stalls. It's really bad. Um, low control deflections, just fine. Uh, let me uh, run another little clip for you here, and, and you'll see. In, in this clip, I'm, I lift the glider up square like this. I'm lifting with my shoulders, and you'll see that the rear wheel comes up just before, just about the same time as the nose. And you'll see uh, that because I haven't had to put in any, I haven't put in any Elevon to fly it up like this, I've lifted it up and I'm flying it in place, the flow is very nice. All these little yarns are going straight back like this and everything looks peachy and I have good control over the wing. Um, so let's watch that one. Welcome back. Uh, didn't that look much better? So you might say, oh, okay, well, I'll just, uh, uh, it's all a matter of how you pick it up. Just make sure that you pick it up level. Don't bring that nose up so high and stall the wing. But if you stop and think about it for a moment, uh, what happens in more extreme flight where you need to do roll reversal or you need to do an avoidance maneuver? You're going to need very large control movements. And, and this Elvon is going to stall. And the flow is going to detach, it's going to run out to the tip, and you're going to lose control of the aircraft. So it's more than just a matter of ground handling, although it's been one of the big drivers. And let me tell you, I've got all kinds of comments from folks out there. I know they're well-meaning, but a lot of people say, oh, it looks like a handful, uh, hard to handle, uh, maybe the pilot's too old. How dare you say I'm too old? Uh, anyway, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a healthy senior citizen. So, uh, and, and some, people, some people actually ask, was it way? It looks way too heavy. None of that has anything to do with any of the difficulty that we've had with ground handling. And let me tell you, some of the ground handling has been very difficult. It has to do with this detached flow. If I have detached flow here, I don't have control of the aircraft anymore. And then it's a struggle. I've got 108 pounds of dead weight, and I can't get the wing back down. I'm in a bank, or I'm in a bad pitch uh, c condition, and I, I can't change it. Uh, this aircraft is intended to be flown in place before you start your takeoff run. It's meant to have, you know, 5 to 10 mile an hour headwind, 15 is better. And if you don't, if you can't control it on that mode, it just looks awful. Uh, it looks like I'm uh, weakling or it looks like uh, the wing's way too heavy. And really it has to do with flow conditions that are on here. So what's causing that problem? Well, uh, let me run a little clip for you here. And uh, you'll get a clue because this is uh, from one of my videos that I posted quite a ways back. If you're an astute observer, uh, you know that I talked about this problem when I was building the Elevon. So let's go listen to that little clip. I had one sixteenth inch 
uh, basswood that was staggered aft slightly and then sanded so that I have the appropriate shape uh, to match up with the bull nose that's on uh, the D-tube of the Elevon and that helps seal this up. I think I might still slip in uh, some of that uh, furry uh, window seal stuff uh, to finish sealing this gap. Uh, but this So there you go. Uh, back then, I was concerned about this gap that's here. The gap between the Elevon and the main wing. And if you're an aerodynamicist or a modeler or so forth, you know that you want to have this as tight as you can have it. Uh, and the reason I built this one so gappy like this was to make it easy to build. Uh, for me, this was an issue with drag, that it, if you have a big gap like this, you get some flow through there, and it's a little draggy, but I didn't care. I wanted to get the thing built. I wanted to get it out and test it, and a little bit of drag here or there wasn't going to bother me. I can come back with seals later and, and cover this up and cut that drag. Um, little did I stop and think, Never considered it. It was probably taught to me in a class somewhere 40 years ago, and I've forgotten, that it's not just drag. Uh, when the Elevon is down like this, it's acting as an airfoil, and it develops its own lift, its own lift profile. So the pressure here is at, at the leading edge of the Elevon, when it's down, is lower than it is on the low surface. The low surface is considerably higher pressure than this upper surface. So not only do you get recirculating flow in here, but if the gap is large enough, the air be wants to go from the low pressure or from the high pressure area to the low pressure area, which means it wants to come from the bottom up to the top, and it, that's what it does. And I'll put up a little picture here around me somewhere, uh, shows you a little diagram, uh, uh, conceptualize what actually happens. So as this goes down, it starts to generate an appreciable amount of its own lift. That flow wants to take the easy way out. And it just goes in that gap, comes out the top. And when it comes out the top, it forces separation to occur here. And not just on the elevator, it's pushing the separation up into the main portion of the wing. So it's promoting a stall on the wing and the elevator stalled, it's really bad. You don't have any lift here. You're not getting any uh, control forces being generated by the elevator and, and you lose control of the aircraft. And that's simply because of the flow going through that uh, gap that's there. So uh, the solution here is to close the gap. And there's a bunch of different ways of doing that. Uh, and those of you who have flown sailplanes probably say, well, I'll just order the curved mylar gap seal stuff. And I did. And uh, it's not suitable for this particular situation. Uh, that's meant for sailplanes. Their gap is small to start with. The aileron's very tight, or their ailerons are very in tight. Not a good solution for me here. So what I have here and uh, this was a backup solution in my mind uh, in that original video when I says, oh, the gap's a little large. I said, if the gap is too large, what I'll do is I will take this uh, uh, synthetic pile, uh, wool-like wool material, sticking on the back. This is normally used on windows. Uh, you put it in the track, and the window slides on this and keeps it airtight, yet allows the window to slide easily. And, and I can mount this on the inside here up underneath inside and I can glue that to the inside of this surface and uh, set it up with, with spacers as needed such that it just lightly brushes against the elevon and the elevon will go up and down and that'll keep it sealed and, and that will probably work. It's most important to keep the bottom sealed because that's where the air wants to get in and come out the top. Um, and this is certainly one way to do it. It doesn't weigh much, doesn't cost much, and it's got sticky back on it. I'd probably use some CA glue, get it stuck on there really good. So that's one way to do it. And then I thought, after I looked at some of the sailplane stuff, I thought about, they, they use Mylar, but I got some just clear plastic stuff here. I think this is 2 mil. I, I have some 4 mil Mylar coming. And I thought about different ways of doing this. Well, I could just tape this on here like that, and the Elevon can do this. And I thought, oh, that's pretty good. But... If you do a 10-foot stretch of this for the whole Elevon, you're bound to have buckles and so forth in it. You never get it to lay perfectly flat like this. And if, the, if you get a low-pressure uh, region occurring, it might lift this up, and then the flow can get started up again. So that's only a, a sort of solution. Um, it, you really need to uh, fill the gap somehow to stop the flow through the gap. 
So a couple, three, four, five days thinking about this, and it finally dawned on me what I can do. I can take, uh, it'll, it'll be a long strip like this, but I'm going to do it this way to make it easy to show you. I can take it and loop, loop it back on itself like this. I can shove this in underneath here like that. This one, and I'm going to just fold this back, would be cut off here at the edge, and I'll use some double-faced tape to hold it on the inside. And then this will be double face taped to the end of the bull nose on the elevon, like this. So there's a lot of extra material inside the gap. And if these are both fixed in position, well, this can still go up and down, and that plastic will just go in and out and in and out. Now, that doesn't stop all of the recirculating flow and the drag associated with that, but that's a minor problem at this point. I need to stop the flow through the gap. And if I get the seal put all the way across the bottom, and I think I will only need it on the bottom. It should seal it off fine. And then the flow should return to normal here for normal control deflections up to about 35 degrees. Once you go past 35, it's going to stall anyway. Might even stall at 30. But if we get to 30 degrees and have constant flow on this, everything will be fine. I did some little tests here in the backyard with my box fan, and it looks like it's going to be effective. But what I'm going to be doing here is I'm going to put in actual mylar strips here along the whole gap on the bottom, uh, not the top that you see here, uh, but done in this fashion. And take it back to Marina Beach, set it up on a couple of sawhorses, and, and I'll run a bunch of tests with it. Uh, and I get a little smoke generator, and I'm going to make sure that we got this all sealed off. We'll watch the telltales, and I'll post that video later, see if we solve this uh, problem. Once that's solved, then it'll be ready to fly. In fact, we came very close at Marina. Uh, I got the glider to lift about uh, upwards 85-90% of my weight, uh, but I was going a little bit crooked, and, and uh, I, I really didn't put my heart into the run because the idea was to just kind of walk it forward to see what it felt like, fly it around a bit, and then maybe go a little faster and, and see what happens. And what I found is that the, the harnesses, uh, the two harnesses are still a bit of a problem. There's a little bit of interference. So it's one of the things that I'm going to be reworking. And also, the shoulder harness having four attachment points, two forward and two aft, is also become problematic. If you look close at the videos, you'll see that the rear straps are probably too long, causing the nose to bias up like this. Uh, because the rear straps are long and the front ones are too short, so it's lifting the nose up and causing the... Uh, if I'm not very careful about keeping the nose down, uh, it, it tends to tilt the glider up into a stall. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch the shoulder harnesses to two connection points. It's going to come right down like this and right from my waist. It's going to go uh, to the pilot's cage right at the cent empty center of gravity of the glider. Uh, so I have a good balance point there. And that way it won't bias it one way or the other. So I hope you enjoy this last little clip of me almost flying. And uh, as I always say, fly safe and bye for now.